Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Toby Hall and Curtis Mischler from Roosevelt Innovations. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Toby Hall, President and CEO, and Curtis Mischler, VP, Chief Data Officer, and Chief of Staff at Roosevelt Innovations. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Toby and Curtis, hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks for having us. I'm so excited to have you guys here. Thank you so much for doing this. I met you two initially when you did the 2022 keynote for Enterprise Data Governance Online Conference. Mm -hmm. And then again in person uh, at our most recent Data Governance and and Information Quality Conference in San Diego. Um, Recently you gave the keynote there in person and that was fabulous. I have to tell you, I told you in writing and I don't say this to everybody, you guys, it's one of my favorite talks. You guys had laughing right from the beginning. You guys really gel so well together. It's really consumable content that you present. It's really just, you guys give a great presentation. Well, data, data governance is a hilarious topic, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> I laugh every day, so I'm yes, not crying. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> barrel monkeys. Well, how long t- have you two been working together? Well, what, Curtis, about six, six seven, seven years? Yeah. Seven, yeah. yeah, about that. Yeah. Nice. Have you always gelled like that, or did it take work? Well, I that's a that actually is a really good question. Uh, I, I no, not right out of the gate, but I think a lot of that comes from dealing with and solving issues together over time. I don't want to say it's quite the foxhole mentality, but there's a little bit of that that goes for sure. Yeah, there's definitely some of that. Yeah, you go through some of the things we've gone through, and you just kind of bond through the experience. <laughs> and we have similar sense of the humor, which which helps too. Uh, helpful. And I love that you, use, again, you've used humor in your presentations. It's just, it's just so great. So, so let's start at the foundation here. So tell me about Roosevelt Innovations. What's the company about? What is it that the company does? Sure. I'll take that one. Uh, we are a wholly owned subsidiary, a spinoff from Delta Dental Plan in Michigan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mothership Delta Dental has always run the business, a dental insurance business with a homegrown platform. Uh, from an IT perspective. They wrote the whole thing themselves back in 2008. We went live initially. And that includes claims, eligibility, billing, the whole stack for what an insurance company would need. And that platform atrophied a bit over time. We accumulated a little bit of tech debt. Uh, It wasn't as robust as it should be. Some IT resources had been diverted to do other things for a number of years. And in about 2016, uh, our board of directors decided it was time to either buy a new platform or rebuild from scratch. And we decided to go end to end and rehab our existing platform, build some new modules from scratch, uh, maybe even buy and integrate some a few pieces. The goal was over a multi-year period, we would end come out the other end with a brand new platform. Uh, great, ambitious endeavor. Our CEO at the time realized this should not be run solely out of IT. Uh, Our IT friends are great. They work their butts off and we love them dearly, but probably a little ambitious and and too big and sweeping for to be confined to IT. Uh, She asked if anyone would be willing to to lead a project and I dared to make eye contact with the beast during that meeting. Uh, I wish I had ducked at the time. Uh, So I ended up getting tagged to lead that project and did that for a number of years. Uh, apparently, it went it went in a favorable direction, and our board of directors spun us off as a separate company to market our IT platform to other dental payers. 
Uh, I joke with our CEO, our current CEO, saying you should be on about your third version of me by now. Uh, platform projects of that size, typically the project sponsor exits somewhere along the way. Uh, you end up cycling through a few of them. The fact that I'm still here, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, maybe he just was asleep at the switch. I don't know. <laughs> That's fascinating. Oh, very interesting. So, so Toby, you also have the title of CEO and president. So what is it you are doing? What is your typical work week? Yeah, I, this is going to be the biggest cliche on earth, but there is no there is no typical week. They're all different. Uh, broad buckets of, of activities, though, depending on where we are in the calendar and what's going on, working with our board of managers, uh, I'm the, the main interface to upward to our board, and that could involve keeping them up to date on product roadmaps, what's in the sales pipeline, uh, getting large decisions approved. So there's those board activities, and Curtis is super helpful in that as well. Uh, then it could be our go-to-market strategy, working with our product roadmaps, uh, dealing with vendors, or what I would argue is actually my favorite part of the whole thing is building the team and making sure we have a culture that I'm proud of. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. And, and Curtis, you yes. hold several titles, VP, Chief Data Officer, Chief of Staff, Mini Hats. So what is what is it you do? What does your work week look like? I'll just I will tell you the garbage bags are always empty. It's fantastic. He does a great <laughs> job. I, I I really try to do my best there, Toby. You know, two three times a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say I play a lot of whack a mole, uh -huh. uh, for better or for worse. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it, it, there's two big hats there. The chief of staff one. It's a lot of strategy, uh, keeping the trains running on time is the way I like to put it. Uh, mm -hmm. addressing the big problems nobody else wants to touch. Toby's got a great way of saying, hey, Curtis, what are you doing right now? I got something for you. Uh, put out fires, just whatever support Toby needs kind of stuff in that role. Uh, from a chief data officer perspective, uh, we've several big data projects that are going on. We have a big archiving and purging initiative that's been away, underway for years. Uh, so I'm very active in that. Is the cat jumps on Toby. I know, my cat just made a, wanted to make a guest appearance on the podcast. She'll be back for sure. Uh, I love it. <laughs> we're working on data catalog selection, reporting strategy, different things like that, uh, helping make sure we're using data appropriately across the organization. Uh, but like Toby said, every week's different. There's there's no one typical. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Makes sense. So, okay. So let's back it way up. So when you were both very young in elementary school, just a, just a young kid, was this the dream? When, did you say, you know, I am going to go work and be, have these many hats and this diverse work week at, uh, you know, at Roosevelt Innovations when I grow up? Definitely no. <laughs> what was the dream? <laughs> Definitely no. Uh, gr growing up and, and maybe later than elementary school, I'll say late middle through high school and college, I always knew I wanted to do something related to either math or physics, very much a quantitative uh, science STEM kind of a mindset. So that, that was always the passion. Didn't know exactly what that would be, but I wanted to do something in the area of, of math and or physics. I had a dream job growing up. There was only one, there was nothing else on the list. It wasn't this, it was, it was astronaut actually. Mm. Minor problem though, six, four is the cutoff. And you can tell, I'm sure for those that are listening that I'm six foot seven. You sound unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, you sound tall. So yeah. So I did major in aerospace engineering. I, I worked as a co-op at Johnson Space Center for a year. Got to go on the, the astronaut training plane called the Vomit Comet, spent some time mission control, but in the end, alas, no, that did not work out. Uh, well, so then tell me. So then so from um astronaut. So Curtis, let's start with you. So where yes. did you go from there? <laughs> yeah, you're basically saying I've fallen the farthest. No, no. <laughs> well, it's because you're six foot seven. You have further to fall. That's it. Yeah, I'm, first, I'm the first one to know it's raining. So uh, yeah, so coming out of college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like, I, I, I kind of knew the aerospace path not ending where I ultimately wanted to be wasn't going to be satisfying for me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know what to do. So I went to management consulting, figured I'd get to see a lot of different things and try a lot of different things. Yeah. Just fell into healthcare by accident doing that, fell into healthcare data by accident within that. And along the way, I just started taking different roles because I thought they looked interesting or unique or different and just bounced around a lot. And somewhere along the way, looking back on it, I realized that 
the astronaut part that really interested me was the exploration, pushing the boundaries, going new places. And then that's actually what I was doing a lot of my career progression. Mm -hmm. And I got lucky enough that I bumped into uh, the Delta Dental of Michigan organization and Toby and was able to help them as a contractor with some of their needs. And I liked it so much, I decided that I just wanted to stay there. So that that's really kind of how I got to where I am right now. A little bit of a luck of the draw, but mainly just kind of following my interests along the way. I, I like that. And, it, and it's following your passion, right? That has taken so many people so many different places, right? Yes. So, so Toby, tell me, so STEM, you're following a STEM career in college and, and where do you go from there? Yeah, so I double majored in math and statistics, or as one of my friends says, I double majored in dork, uh, which is probably not terribly inaccurate. Uh, and when I got done, I, I wondered, you know, what do you do with a bachelor's degree in statistics? And, and the unfortunate answer is not much. Uh, with a master's or a doctorate, there's tons of opportunities, but, but really not, with, uh, not as much as you might think with a bachelor's degree. Uh, not directly. So talking with an advisor, he sort of indicated if you're anything less than 100% committed to, to the doctorate route, graduate school, you might want to think twice about as well, take a year off and get your head straight. So that's basically what I did. Uh, I stuck around, did some research with a professor at the undergraduate institution I went to, taught some classes while I was there and thought, well, this teaching thing isn't so bad. So post-baccalaureate, I actually went back and got a secondary teaching endorsement, and I was a high school teacher. Mm. So taught high school for, high, I was certified high school math and history, uh, taught math, everything from these are numbers, they're your friends, they won't hurt you, all the way up through calculus, uh, kind of everything in between. Taught it, uh, taught at a high school all day, and then taught at community college at night. I was 23, um, not very bright. I thought everybody showed up for work at like seven in the morning and worked till 10 at night. I thought that's what everybody did. So I teach at the school, high school all day. Then I go teach at the college all night and, you know, wow. roll into my apartment at 1030 and start it all over again the next day. I thought that's what adults did. Uh, and somewhere along the way, I, I wanted to do something in the summer that would, I could come back to the classroom and tell students, this is why you need to learn math. And look into the actuarial profession, was going to do an actuarial internship. Fell in love with the actuarial profession and went whole hog. Uh, worked at one of the big four consulting firms as an actuarial consultant for a number of years. That's when I jumped over to Delta Dental about 20 years ago and worked my way up to, to chief actuary at Delta Dental. And for about five years there, I was doing the chief actuary job and leading this project that eventually became Roosevelt. And there were definitely some dark days. I would not recommend doing two full-time jobs at once. Uh, not, not a great choice of mine, but... Uh, but it was awesome. I've never worked that hard, but had that much fun and learned that much in my whole life. It was fantastic. Oh, I love it. I, I, I love it. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, I was say, I think Toby and I may have worked for the same big four at the same time, just in different parts of it and never ran into each other. Yeah, we were in the same, uh, the same geographic practice area, but two different practice lines. And I do believe we overlapped. Never, never knew each other at that time. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, lots of stories like that uh, across my career as well. People, when I used to work for Microsoft, people ask me all the time, hey, do you know so-and-so when I tell them I work for Microsoft? You know they employ 30,000 just right in this city, right? <laughs> Shannon, do you know Bill Gates? <laughs> no, but I was on an email with him once. I was very oh. excited about that. <laughs> <Very exciting. laughs> all right, so, so tell me, um, so what has been your biggest lesson so far in your career then? You know, I mean, Toby, you're talking about working a lot of hours, a lot of, it, mostly for two different jobs. Um, what's, what's some of the biggest takeaways that you, that you use today even? So I, I would tell you the only way that was possible to, to pull that off is to have people behind you that you trust, have a bench of people, you know, Curtis included on, the, on this side of the house, uh, had some talented actuaries that worked under me on the other side of the house, being able to delegate and focus on what's really important, um, the few one or two strategic things, that was critical. Uh, more broadly, the biggest lesson I would tell you career-wise is, and again, it's I'm gonna be the cliche factory today, it's never stop learning. And, and I mean that generically, learning doesn't have to mean learning a new skill or technology or staying what's on top, uh, what trends are going on in your industry. Mm -hmm. Those are all important, but learning can also just be doing new things. Nothing beats doing 
you're trying to learn. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've agreed to a project or been assigned a project with absolutely no idea how I was going to pull it off. But those have been some of the most pivotal educational moments. Not saying I succeeded every time, but I definitely <laughs> learned every single time. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I've heard other leaders say this, that, that learning, or no matter how you're doing, learning is like the equivalent of compound interest. It's not the little bit of learning today, just like it's not about the dollar you invest today. It's about on top of all of the other dollars over time, what that does. And learning is the same thing. A, an incremental little piece of learning done consistently over time, you'll pick your head up in five years and be shocked at where you are. I, I love that advice. And I think it's so important to hear that from executives. Uh, it, you know, I think so many... It, you know, especially I, I will say it speaking, you know, for my own youth, you know, you think that you get to the top and that's it, you know, you've succeeded and there you go and you're just rolling from there on out. Right. But it's not, it's, it's a lot of that's work. Hard, right? You got to keep learning. Right. And keep that's growing. Absolutely right. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. So uh, Curtis, what about you? What are you, some of the biggest lessons so far in your career? Uh, so a couple, uh, one, somewhere along the way, I realized that the people you work with is probably more important than the work itself. And if you don't really like the people you're around, life's too short. Why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. And I think that really is a two-way street, though, because you have to demonstrate that as well, right? Like, do you want to be that person that's grumpy all the time, no one wants to come ask for help, or do you want to be that person that's willing to step in and do whatever needs to get done and do it with a smile? You're going to go a lot further, you know, with that kind of approach. So that's been big for me. And actually, that's why I'm at Roosevelt, quite honestly. It's because of people. It's because of Toby and others that we work with that, you know, I, I just decided this is the group I want to end my career with. So, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. So that's one. Yeah. Speaking of ending your career, we have a, a meeting with HR later. Curtis. Oh, very good. <laughs> uh, well, wait, wait till I get to my third lesson. Oh, okay. uh, the second one is uh, you got to take chances at times. You know, like even, you know, Toby's example about taking on the, the Roosevelt Project wasn't called that at the time, but mm -hmm. that was a chance. And sometimes you got to do that. And I've taken some chances in my career and they paid off. I've taken some that haven't and things change as a result, but I've realized that nothing's really fatal. You know, you, you learn from it, you grow from it, but if you're just going to go in and keep your head down all the time, you're not going to progress anywhere. You're not going to make the business better. You're not going to advance your career. Uh, and then the third one is, yeah, just be really careful about working with people who have dog names. I'm just saying. <laughs> Everybody knows a dog named Toby. <laughs> With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. <laughs> oh, well, you can so let me, let me cover uh, something really quick, but uh, you both mentioned how important um, culture is, the people you work with. I mean, Toby, you mentioned from the beginning, you know, how important it was to build the right staff and the right culture. What is that? And what have, what have you done to, to build that? And what does that mean to you? Yeah. And I, I would tell you, I think some people overthink this. They make it too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know my team right now, my direct reports, they're all plugging their ears going, oh, he's going to say it. I know he's going to say it again because I say it all the time. Yeah. I, I think there's really four steps and it's all about the same four steps over and over again. And, I, and I, I don't mean to trivialize it because they're not easy, but yeah. step one is put the right people in the right roles. Mm -hmm. And that is a point in time kind of thing. The minute the pieces are on the chessboard, the other side moves, the game changes, you got to move some people around. Um, I moved some people around just this morning. Um, it's it's kind of how it goes. Mm -hmm. but, but if you get the right people in the right roles, like the battle is mostly won. That's step one. Step two, make sure they have the right vision of what you're trying to accomplish. And be really, really clear on what that vision is and make sure it's a compelling vision. It's not anything trivial. It's, it's ambitious, but not demoralizing. Step number three, make sure you give them the right culture. Mm -hmm. And then if you've done that, if you've got the right people in the right role, they have the right vision, they have the right culture, step four, stay out of their way. Let them do their job, delegate, push the decisions down. Uh, and if you're unwilling to do that, either one, your ego is the problem, which could easily be, it could be an ego thing, or you didn't do steps one through three correctly. If you did them the correct way, you should be more than happy to just get out of the way and let them do their thing. They will bring you in when they need you. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but that culture piece, I think sometimes that's underestimated. 
and people make it into a big production. They have a big culture statement. And, and those things aren't bad. Don't get me wrong. That's that's a necessary step, but that's not enough. That That's not nearly, you know, in the math world, we would say that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. The true culture creation is the micro level interactions you have with your team over a long period of time. It's not about putting a mural up in the lobby. It's about how you greet your team on a Monday morning consistently, week after week after week. That, that creates culture. How you, how you reward innovation, how you, you don't punish people who try to innovate and things don't work out. Like that's, that's an okay thing that happens. Um, negligence, carelessness, that has to be dealt with in a different way. But it, it's all of those things, realizing that not in a strange, creepy way, but in a very real way, your team is watching you and, and how you act makes a big difference. Uh, I, early days, I'm not as conscious now about it, but early days, I was even super careful about where I parked my car uh, really? in the parking lot. You know, do I want to park in a reserve spot right up next to the door or do I park out in the middle of the lot? And I'll tell you, the answer is I park out in the middle of the lot. Nice. I like it. Curtis, it, uh, I'd like to add to, just a little bit to that too, because a huge part of the Roosevelt journey and the spinoff has been around culture. Mm -hmm. And I do think open communication is a huge piece of that. And I have to say, Toby is probably the most open, transparent executive I've ever worked with. So when it comes to communicating the team, helping them understand where we're going, why we're doing what we're doing, uh, the headwinds we might be facing, he puts it all out there. And I think that builds a certain level of trust that really does then help reinforce that culture that we're trying to create. That's really nice. I, I like that a lot. Um, so, so important. And I assume that trickle down effect um, resonates then out to your customers. Oh, I'm sorry. Gonna, I, 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 I know just, you're uh, going to trickle down economics. I know. I know. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I regret it as soon as I said it. But, yeah. but. and I'm a firm believer, especially, and, and I have direct interactions with our customers too, and I'm equally transparent with them. I'm a firm believer that. You know, if there's something going on, if if a, if a new software release is getting pushed back a couple of weeks, maybe, uh, I'll communicate that directly to the customers. And is it a message they like hearing? Sometimes no. Now, sometimes it works better with their lineup and they're actually glad. But uh, sometimes they've been waiting for that new release. And if we have to push it, they're, they're not thrilled with that. But at least they've heard the message. And at least we've had a chance to talk about it. And if you just let it go out in an email or let it just, the day comes and goes without the release, that's not going to be. Very nice. So, you know, let's bring it back then a little bit to uh, data, right? The, <laughs> the car won't. <Yeah. laughs> but, you know, a, a lot of it, the culture, of course, is so important to data and data management. And, uh, you know, from your presentation, your data governance program uh, uh, reflects a lot of that. Can you tell me a little bit about your program and why you have a data governance program? Yeah, so we started the data governance program in 2016, uh, which was right around that time that the, the platform replatforming initiative was kicking off. And there were a few drivers at that time. One was uh, we knew we had a lot of data we probably didn't need to be still holding on to. So just from a retention perspective, archiving, purging, et cetera, there, that was a big piece of it. Another was we knew we had new business coming onto the platform. And based on its size, we were going to be stranding a little bit under the weight of all that extra data. So we want to make sure that we were looking at that the right way and understanding how we were going to handle that. But then also just the fact that, hey, we're going through and looking at this thing and recoding and doing all this kind of work. Now would be a great time if we've got some issues to try to clean them up from day one, try to put in some good practices from day one, realizing, you know, we use the analogy, we're building the plane while flying it. And it feels like that pretty much every day. But we had all these different business needs that were in play. And it was complicated by the fact that at that point in time, IT owned data, not the business. And I think that was more of a historical thing that IT took it because nobody else wanted it. It was like a hot potato. Mm -hmm. So part of what we wanted to do culturally too was just shift that mindset as well to say, hey, you know, data is really, it's there for a business reason. The business needs to own it. IT certainly supports it, has a huge uh, responsibility around it. But at the end of the day, it's the business users who need to be using it. So I, I think those were some of the main reasons. Toby, anything you want to add on that? No, I think you nailed it. That's exactly right. That's a, that's great. So then 
so tell me then putting data at the forefront of your culture, you know, what is your definite definition of data and how is it each of you uh, work with data? Yeah, I, I would say data is pretty much any information that the company or an organization needs to create or use during its day-to-day -day operations. And I'm very careful to say information because data has taken on this much broader um, characterization. It's not purely numeric things anymore. Data, for example, in our world, data could be uh, the click patterns that our users use on one of our web portals. Understanding what their click patterns are so that our product designers can make sure that the portals are very easy to use, very intuitive. Uh, that's data, click patterns, that's data. Uh, yeah. An x-ray that comes in with a dental client, that's data. Uh, it's unstructured data, and we have to find a way to manage it and live with it. So I would say it's, it's all of those things. And in the spirit of the cliches of the day, I, I think about the organization as being a giant a gasoline engine, and data is the oil that makes that engine run properly. Now, could you could you drive your car with it being a quart low on oil? Sure, of course you could. It just would be a very, very bad idea, and it wouldn't work for very long. Same thing with the data in an organization. Uh, it is the fuel for decision making. Uh, anything in the modern economy is that it always comes back to what what data can we get to help us make that decision. And if the data is not trustworthy, it's not available, it's not understood clearly, we're going to be making some bad. So is that and is that part of your the what you're constantly learning, Toby? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Curtis, what about what about you? What's your definition of data, especially as the the chief data yeah. officer? You know, and and how do you use it? I, I echo a lot of what Toby said. Yeah, I, I see data as basically all the inputs. You know, we're constantly barraged every single day. You know, us as human beings, our systems, our organization, all these inputs, it's all data. The challenge is trying to sift through that and say, well, what really matters and what doesn't? What's just noise? And what is, hey, there's a signal there trying to tell us something. Back to Toby's point, making it information. And information could be because, oh, this piece of data actually has relevant meaning to us, so it qualifies as information. In some cases, it may be, oh, if we take this piece of data and do something with it, then it becomes information. But getting to, down to that, to me, is the real key to it. You know, one of the things that we've been uh, working on is, you know, making data available to our customers. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, I could say, here it is, a big pile of data. And they were looking at, yeah, but I don't know what this means. Like, like, what does that column? What's this one do? Like, how do they interact? Without that, inf with that additional data on top of it, you can't get the information. It's meaningless. So I think that's a big part of what we're doing is just trying to wade through all of this, call the stuff that needs to be called, get rid of the, the smoky layers to the point where actually that has meaning what we're looking at. And I think the challenges that come with that have even taken on a very different um, look and feel. Uh, when I did undergrad and then the actuarial exams, a lot of the techniques and methods and, and thought processes that, that got ingrained into me were around data is difficult to get, it's expensive to store, you never have enough of it, how do you wrench as much insight out of the data that you have, don't ever waste a bite of data, like that's, that's the whole mindset of traditional statistics and I would argue actuarial science. Now, I, I look at the, the young men and women being trained today, their problem is 180 degrees the opposite. It, it's you land in a chair, you've got thousands of columns and millions of rows, and you don't even know how to make sense of it. You, you're awash in data, and you don't even know where to begin. How do you begin to find patterns when you can't even get your arms around how massive the quantities are? And that's just in a, in a relatively short time span, we've made that leap. And trying to make sure we're putting the right data in the decision maker's hands while that characteristic is going on in the background, that, that's a unique challenge. Indeed. So, so let's talk about people coming into the workforce. So to both of you, you know, uh, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Yeah, I would say definitely, definitely increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's probably an offensive and a defensive side to this. I would say when you're, when an organization is playing defense, thinking about data management, it's because there's such a sensitivity and awareness for good reason around proper data hygiene, data access, data controls. You know, at the extreme, this is regulation like HIPAA and, and other things, uh, consumer protection laws that, that govern our use and storage of data. So that sort of is a, is a defensive play. Organ no one wants to have that Wall Street Journal story about a data breach. Nobody wants to be that organization. So that's definitely there, and that's going only in one direction, and that's increasing. 
Uh, but then there's also the offensive side to data. As the data becomes more uh, voluminous and comes at us faster and faster, uh, and we want to make better quality decisions, this whole notion of understanding data, where did it come from, what does it mean? As, as Curtis eloquently said, going from data to information to insight to action, being able to follow that arc, uh, that, that takes some skill. And, and I would argue it's a little bit different. Data management is a little bit different than input management of any other type. If you are managing uh, factory raw materials, you don't necessarily have to understand all that much about how those raw materials are used. But if you're managing data within an organization, you bet you. You have to understand how that data came to be, who's consuming the data, what are they using it for? If you're gonna effectively manage it, you have to understand that soup to nuts. If you're managing parts in a, in a manufacturing plant, equally important job, but you don't necessarily need to know about the end user. And how, do you, how important do you think that is for a CEO to understand? I think the CEO needs to be conversant and needs to know which questions to ask and, mm -hmm. and push on things and make sure the direction the team is moving with data management is in alignment with the CEO vision, for sure. Oh, I love and it. Then you, then, then you call Curtis and say, hey, are you busy? I got something for you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you broke up there. I didn't catch that. <laughs> Uh, and, and I love that description. It's the first time I've heard offensive and defensive, and it makes so much sense. Uh, it, 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 yeah, I, I like that description of that. So, yeah, I mean, so a lot of people look at Toby and think offensive, but that's okay. most people. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Curtis, so tell me, do you see the number of jobs work increasing, increasing? Do you agree with Do you agree with Toby, or or I, do, you have I do. I mean, after this call, it might be decreasing by one, but overall, <laughs> I do think it is. It is increasing. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have the exact numbers, you know, how many petabytes of data we as a world, a society are generating every day, but that's exponentially growing and I, no end in sight. Like, I don't know why that would change anytime soon. So I do think it's just more and more and more and more businesses are going to compete. They're going to exist based on data and it's going to come down to who can do the most beneficial things with it. And I think it's beneficial for those organizations, but also beneficial for the consumers. I think more and more people are starting to realize that a lot of that data that's out there describes me or actually should belong to me. And now we start getting into ethics and morals and what should we or should not we be doing with different things. And that's a big part of what we do because in the healthcare space, that's very sensitive data. We have PHI, we have PII. And a lot of what we talk about is what's the appropriate use? What does it make sense that we could say, yes, we can do it? You know, Toby mentioned the breach article. We also don't want to be on that front page article because we did something with someone's data that we shouldn't have been doing with it. So that's really important to us that we get clear on that. Uh, but back to the original question, I do think that it's not just uh, companies that business is based on data itself, you know, like social media companies and others. I think all aspects of every business, there's just so much more data that's become available it's deciding how to make the best use of it so it actually helps you in the marketplace. I like it. I, it's, I, and so then what advice would you give to people who are looking to get into a career in data management, either on the offense or the defensive side? Uh, and uh, I, either one, Curtis, can I start with that one this time? Oh, sure. I, I would say just roll up your sleeves and, and jump right into it. You know, we, we've kind of touched on this, but really understanding where the data comes from, where it's been, where it's going, how it's manipulated, what's it used for, how it can be misinterpreted, all those different things. Just go down that rabbit hole because the more you specialize, the more you learn, I think the more valuable you're going to be. Early in my career, I really struggled with, you know, inch wide, mile deep or mile wide, inch deep. And I, for the most part, been a generalist because I like to do so many different things. But the points in my career where it actually kind of made a big leap is when I really specialized, where I really went in and got to know something really, really well. Mm -hmm. And I think the insights you gain from doing that help your career, they help your organization. And back to one of my earlier points, be one of those people that shares that information. Be that resource that people want to go to and ask for help because I know that you're going to provide that guidance. Don't be the grumpy old SME in the corner that nobody wants to talk to, who knows everything, but everyone hates working with that person. Because that's just not fun for anybody. I mean, you think about how much time we spend at work every day, yeah. you know, just pay it forward. Be part of that. Because trust me, you're not going to lose your position because you shared too much. 
And if anything, your, your power and respect in the organization actually is going to go up because you are a trusted resource because people know if they go and ask you a question, you're going to have the answer. If you don't, you'll say you don't, and you'll be able to help get them to the right place. But just be open with it, learn what you can learn and share that with the people around you. That's my advice. Uh, I, I love that. Support. We're, you know, it's been fun in doing these podcasts and getting and hearing some common themes. Uh, like you mentioned, being curious. I'm hearing that a lot from data professionals, just be curious, be curious about the data, be curious about why the business needs it and, and what they're using it for. Um, but to share it, that's, that's new. Uh, and I, and I love that advice to, you know, it, you don't hang on to it, <laughs> what you learn. <laughs> but I think that's really, really important. Toby, what advice would you give to um, people looking to give, uh, to get into a career in data management? Yeah, so I got, I got three things, three thoughts. Uh, yeah. One, the first one would be make sure you balance, make an effort to balance the quick wins with the big rocks. Mm -hmm. And back, and that was a theme in our keynote uh, a couple of weeks back in mm -hmm. San Diego was we knew some of the things we wanted to accomplish with data governance were going to take a long time, like spanning multiple years. And organizations don't sometimes have the attention span for that or the wherewithal. They want to see that payoff a little bit earlier. And, and that's okay. That keeps you honest. That yeah. doesn't mean you don't do the big rocks. That means you, you get the ball rolling, you start chipping away at them, but you also look for those quick wins where you can demonstrate value along the way. Uh, nothing keeps uh, your, your executive team's attention and engagement quite like declaring wins along the way. So I, I, that's one thing I would say is if you want to make a difference and accomplish the big multi-year tasks, make sure you're balancing it with some quicker wins along the way. Uh, number two would be echoing what Curtis said. Don't be afraid to roll up your sleeves and, and understand the data. Uh, data, it, it begs to be understood. Data just as columns in a, in a table, not all that interesting, not all that useful. Understanding how those columns got to be, how did they land there? What did these things represent? What is the process that created that data in the first place? That'll help you really understand what, what you're up against and what the operations are all about. And then the third one, I would say, if you're interested in a career in data management, I would say, make sure you're finding an organization that either already has a culture that supports data management, or you think has a reasonable likelihood of evolving into that. Uh, many cultures don't have it right out of the gate. And that, that's not an indictment. Maybe they just never had the awareness, the resources. But an organization that's going to support you as you try to help build that culture, that'll make it so much more rewarding, so much more um, effective. Uh, we, I think we've been blessed, we've been lucky that our organization views the data governance function as, as not merely um, a, a necessary bureaucracy that has to be tolerated. It's, it's a partner at the table to help us do things the right way and make the business a better place. And finding that culture or a place where you can help build that culture, that, that's where it's all going to happen. Right there. Uh, uh, it's, it's Music to my ears, because you're right. I mean, so many organizations um, have yet to discover that. I've had a lot of people approach me asking, you know, how do we get executives to buy off on this and, and understand that this is important? You know, how do I get our executives to understand that data governance is not a dirty word? It's not something that just makes us adhere to the laws, right? <laughs> no. And so, but that's such great at cult, uh, career advice, you know, finding... Uh, a culture that will support your passion. Um, and, and, and I think it ties back to your previous question about jobs growing or shrinking in this space. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, knowing that the backdrop is those jobs are increasing, I, I think that's a unanimous kind of opinion. Yeah. I think you can afford to be a little picky about the culture. It's kind of the, it's, it's a good problem to have, but right. it's, it's an issue. You're going to have to pick that culture that you think is a good fit for you. And back to something Curtis said earlier, a lot of that is the people you work with. Now, when you go through that interview, you're interviewing them every bit as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah, that's so very true. Um, so very true. Anything else you want to add? No, I, I thank you for having us. I, it's been a blast. Yeah, I, same. Yeah. Well, both to both of you. I mean, I'm so grateful that you took the time to share. Um, and more of what you do and why you're doing it. And it's, it's really been a great uh, to hearing about uh, your journey along the way and how you are, how you got to where you are. Um, and if you become a data Insider, you can hear the, your keynote speech uh, from 
DTIQ. So <laughs> I highly recommend it. Oh. <laughs> well, anything, uh, so I will um, post your information too on the website and just thank you again so much for uh, being involved in today's podcast. And for all the listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.